Further speakers to the uh, notified motion? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, it should come as no surprise to anyone in this chamber that I strongly support this motion. This is a motion that we should not have to be spending time on today. But sadly, here we are yet again, today raising this important issue because the state Labor government are hell-bent on destroying Queensland's nightlife and are hell-bent on ensuring Queensland is Australia's nanny state. Chair, last week's spin from the Labor Attorney General, and let's call it for what it is, spin, again shows that the Labor government doesn't listen, doesn't learn, and doesn't support the many thousands of people who work so hard to grow our nighttime economy and enhance the culture of this new world city. Now, when the Labor government first mooted these laws back in 2015, I joined thousands in making very clear the devastation that would ensue on the businesses, residents, artists and places that these laws seek to conquer. We warned them that these laws would have a shattering impact on Brisbane's nighttime economy, that they would force businesses to close, that they would cause job losses and, as many experts had warned, would lead to an increase in preloading. But unfortunately, Chair, they fell on deaf ears. And you don't have to be Sherlock to know, Chair, that they have done exactly that. I take absolutely no pleasure or pride in standing here today in this chamber after four years, having witnessed these warnings go unheeded by Labor, having witnessed the countless businesses struggling to survive, having witnessed our community lose talented artists to places elsewhere, having witnessed the, council, the countless job losses. Our community is at a loss. What will it take for Labor to listen? We have all read the reports and seen the results, and Chair, the evidence is damning. These ham-fisted laws have not seen a reduction in violence, but have instead seen a dangerous increase in preloading and drug taking. They have punished the majority for the sins of a few. And still, the issues these laws claim to address have not improved. Make no mistake, these laws have unequivocally failed to realise the change that Labor so naively claimed it to be capable of. These laws have destroyed family small businesses and seen many young people lose their jobs. These laws have seen talented Brisbane artists forced to go interstate to hone their craft. These laws have seen tourists stopped from entering our bars and clubs. And as Councillor Murphy said, let us not forget the international embarrassment that ensured when Queensland and Brisbane became a laughing stock around the globe when His Royal Highness Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark, a future king, was refused entry to a bar. All because Labor thinks you need a scanning machine to tell you whether someone will cause trouble or not. His Royal Highness was and is clearly no threat to anyone. But you don't hold your breath waiting for Labor to understand that without first arming them with one of their beloved scanning machines, you'll surely lose consciousness before Labor listens to reason. And enough is enough, Chair. When will this arrogant state Labor government admit they were wrong? When will they side with small businesses, young people, musicians and entertainers? I must admit, Chair, it pains me to admit that I fear they never will. I fear that they have dug their heads so deep into the ground that they are immune to listening to any evidence or rational discussion on these laws. Chair, as you know, I love my area and I love enjoying its many wonderful venues. Just like last Friday, when I was delighted to see the Deputy Leader of the Opposition at the opening of the Fortitude Music Hall. Chair, as you know, the Fortitude Music Hall is a stunning world-class new venue that strengthens Brisbane's position as Australia's new world city. It's a venue that strongly enhances the work we have done to ensure the Brunswick Street Mall and the Valley remains a mecca for live music and artistic expression. From what I saw, Chair, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was certainly having a great time last Friday, as were we all. The opening was a great celebration and provided a wonderful opportunity to catch up with many people who have worked so hard to grow Brisbane's nighttime economy. One thing I heard consistently on the night was that the Labor government just doesn't get it, that these laws have failed. It was absolutely heartbreaking to hear again local traders tell me how these laws have had a negative impact on their businesses, how these laws are causing unnecessary expenses, 
how these laws are stopping them from opening longer, how these laws are stopping them from employing more people, how these laws are stopping them from booking more local talent. To hear over and over again our hard-working local traders tell me how they feel helpless. Helpless because, despite their best attempts, the state Labor government just won't listen and remains intent on continuing it to dance to its own failed beat. So, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was enjoying himself last week, I hope he took the time to listen to the many venue operators and workers in attendance and hear how these botched laws continue to wreak havoc on Brisbane's nighttime economy how these laws continue to cause job losses and how these laws continue to damage our city's reputation. I hope he listened and I hope he takes great care and consideration to taking their views on board. I hope that he will now stand in solidarity with them. I challenge him to take the fight up to his besties in 1 William Street and to challenge him to do the right thing to honour the residents he has solemnly sworn to serve and fight for them. Because if he doesn't, I fear for many residents, businesses, workers and artists who continue to be subjected to these misguided, ineffective laws. Of course, if he doesn't, he will prove that he, like others in his party, are steadfast in their determination to ensure that Brisbane becomes a city of dampened potential, where people spend their nights at home watching Netflix with a large bag of twisties, rather than enjoying a rocking night out to great bands like DZ Death Rays. He will prove that he doesn't care about Brisbane's nighttime economy. He will prove that he doesn't support small business and he will prove that he doesn't support local artists. He will prove yet again that he doesn't care about jobs and that he doesn't care about the 99 per cent of the population who do the right thing. He will prove what we already think, that he is all bark and no bite. Chair, from the Trifford to the Tivoli and from RGs to Birdies, this administration continues to work hard together with local businesses to ensure the Valley continues to grow and be Brisbane's entertainment mecca. We do this in the face of the draconian laws that our community is forced to endure. We strongly support Brisbane's nighttime economy and those who have invested their blood, sweat and tears to make Brisbane what it is, to create an environment for people to work rest and play. I call on the state Labor government to scrap these ridiculous laws now. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Chair. And I tell you, it's nice to be talked about. It's nice to be, it's nice to be obsessed over even, Mr Chair. Um, uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting contribution uh, from Councillor Howard. And I was there at the opening. I tell you what, I paid for my ticket, Mr Chair. Uh, I wasn't up in the dress circle. When, they, when Councillor Murphy talks about safe drinking, uh, we know what he means uh, up there with the VIPs, <laughs> sipping his French champagne with the, uh, out, of his crystal, out of his crystal champagne flute, Mr Chair. We know what he's talking about when it comes to drinking safe, but Mr he's Chair. About the workers. But he's worried about the workers, of worried. course. Yeah. That hypocrite over there. Mr Chair, is worried tonight, worried about those workers that his party, his party not only uh, voted to strip uh, away their penalty rates, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, uh, Mr Chair, it is true, it is true, Mr Chair, because uh, a motion was put to the federal parliament about a dozen times um, to restore sir, penalty rates Councilor, and the LNP. Well, Mr Chair, they were talking about penalty I rates. They talked that. about penalty rates. <laughs> Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order, point of order, Councillor Murphy. I think uh, Councillor Cassidy has forgotten uh, what level of government he was elected to. Uh, we're talking about lockout laws in the Brisbane City Council, not federal parliament. Remember, he, he missed the opportunity to run for the seat of Lily. Okay, he didn't nominate for pre-selection, so that's not, not my fault. Order, that's Councilor no one. Murphy. That's no one on this point. side of the chamber's Councilor fault. Okay. Murphy. At least I didn't run away with my towel between my legs, buddy. Councillor Murphy. All right. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, the substantive You'll keep, motion. Don't worry. You'll keep. The substantive motion in front of us is about. Is about. Point of order, uh, chair. Point of order, Councillor Marks. Could I just clarify that when someone says "you'll keep," is that to be taken as a threat? If you, if you want. I've I've never found it to be a threatening phrase, but. Um, but so, I just think, uh, but I would, I would ask Councillor Cassidy to um, return to the substance of the motion in front of him, please. And for the, and while we, we are enjoying ourselves, please focus on the task at hand, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when, when those opposite try and get up and lecture 
uh, us, the Labor councillors on this side, about our support for hospitality workers. Uh, we know uh, that that is a front. That is a front, a, a political ploy, Mr Chair. We know that they're the party of stripping penalty rates. We know they're the party of stripping superannuation for those earning under $50,000 a year, Mr Chair. So I will not be lectured by those opposite about our support for those working in the hospitality industry. Now, to Councillor uh, Howard's point, um, yes, uh, I was there at the Fortitude Music Hall opening. Um, I have to say I was enjoying listening to DZ uh, Death Rays, uh, to Tia Gostolo, to Bernard Fanning. I wasn't uh, there um, with the hoi polloi circle that uh, Councillor Howard was and the Lord Mayor was. Uh, I was actually there with uh, 3,000 other uh, people down regular. on the floor, regular people. <laughs> that's right, enjoying, enjoying that venue, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, when it comes to the numbers, it is very clear. In a nightclub precinct since 2016, there have now been zero deaths. Zero. There's been a 29 per cent reduction in drop-in ambulance call-outs at safe night precincts between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. There's been a 29 per cent overall drop in serious assaults between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. 14,795 banned patrons were caught trying to enter venues by ID scanners. One serious crime a week, Mr Chair, has been solved by ID scanning, including rape and grievous bodily harm. What do you have to say about that, Councillor Murphy? <clears throat> and a 40 per cent drop in serious assaults between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the Fortitude Valley and the Toowoomba Safe Night Precinct, Mr Chair. We know what this is all about, Mr Chair. This is about Councillor Murphy thinking he's king of the kids. Uh, he can get up here and grandstand and think he's in touch somehow, uh, Mr Chair. But, but his behaviour uh, shows that um, he really isn't, Mr Chair. And this is uh, just a big political um, ploy by members of this administration to try and get themselves a bit of free publicity. Uh, the statistics show how effective elements of uh, these uh, laws have been. And as we've heard from the Leader of the Opposition, the Queensland Government has announced uh, some changes following a review, uh, and they are pursuing that. Uh, and uh, the statistics show that they have, these laws have worked. One serious crime a week, including rape and grievous bodily harm, uh, have been solved as a direct result. Yes, Councillor Mackay. Yes, money bags. Solved. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, yes, yeah. that's right. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Yeah. Point of order for you, Councillor Owen. Mr Chairman, in accordance with the meeting's local law, councillors are Moneybags. to refer to each other as councillors, not by other derogatory terms. Yeah, I agree, Councillor Allen. Point of order, Mr yeah. Chair. Would Councillor Cassidy take a question? Can I, I'll deal with the first point of order, then I'll come to you. Um, courtesy and proportionality are fundamental in this place. And Councillor Cassidy, I ask you to treat all, play, all people in this place with respect and courtesy. Councillor Adams. I would wonder if Councillor Cassidy would take a question. Councillor no. Cassidy, will you take a question? No, Mr. Councillor Chair. Cassidy will not take a question. Of course he won't. Oh, oh so that wet yeah. lettuce across my face, Mr. Chair. How it hurts. How it hurts. There we go. There we go. Now, Councillor Mackay just interjected, and I'll take his interjection, Mr. Chair. He scoffed. He scoffed at rapes and grievous bodily harms I'm not sure being solved. Right. He Point just did. Everyone to, heard you, mate. To you, Claim to be misrepresented. It's been noted, Councillor Mackay. Councillor Cassidy, please continue. So it's pretty clear what this is about, Mr Chair. It's about Councillor Murphy um, just trying to grandstand a bit. The statistics are clear uh, and action is being taken in consultation uh, with businesses in these precincts uh, and we commend the Queensland Government for doing that. Uh, Councillor Mackay, your uh, misrepresentation. Don't you dare say I scoff no, at No, rape. Councillor Mackay, you, you, you direct Chair. your comments through me and you will, you will stick to the substance of the matter at hand. Chair, please. I did not scoff at rape. I scoffed at the fact that he said they were being solved, which thank is probably you, erroneous you, instead McCoy. of... Um, 
A further speakers, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I take the interjections of those absolutely obnoxious, rude men on the other side. That when they're backed up into a corner, they come screaming out like the bullies they truly are. They honourably support the union mates that they back day in and day out on the attacks that they're actually talking about. Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Griffith. I just find that absolutely offensive. And I believe that should be withdrawn. I find that absolutely offensive that councillor, the deputy mayor in this chamber can say that, no substance against the, uh, the men on this side of the chamber. That is thank, offensive. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, uh, deputy mayor, will you withdraw the comment? I won't withdraw. The streaming will clearly show the rude, obnoxious behaviour that we just saw and the interjections from councillor Cassidy and councillor Griffiths, which were totally out of line. Point of order, Matt. Uh, Mr Chairman, I find that absolutely offensive and I'm requesting it's withdrawn. It's not acceptable. Um, there's been, this debate has drawn some pretty unpleasant language out of everybody. I've asked the Deputy Mayor if she would withdraw. She has declined. We'll continue. Can, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. This debate is about supporting those businesses, small and medium, across Brisbane to make sure that we support our nighttime economy and make sure that there is more to do and see across Brisbane at all times of the day. Brisbane is a new world city and we are a proud, vibrant nightlife. But what we are not supporting is the harmful and arbitrary lockout laws that have been placed on our night precincts by the state Labor government. We said these laws would be ineffective. We said these laws, like every Labor policy, was a solution looking for a problem. We said these laws would do nothing to curb violence but have an unnecessary impact on our Brisbane nightlife, and it is predicted, as we said, came true. Make no mistake, these lockout laws are not only ineffective but completely detrimental to safety, lifestyle and local businesses in these areas. Today, as we've heard from my two previous speakers on this side of the chamber, we are calling on the Palaszczuk Labor government to scrap these laws in full for once and for all. The rezoning of Caxton Street is far too late. Patronage has already been lost and operators have closed down as a result. Not to mention the inequality of business regulations across this city. Caxton Street? No. Scanners out. Valley? Yes. Scanners in. Queensworld? Oh, goodness, no. No scanners. South Brisbane? Yes. They're in. How do you expect people to think it is a fair economy when there's one rule for some people and the others at the whim of a government, again, who is a solution looking for a problem? These laws have failed in Melbourne, they failed in Perth and in Sydney, and surprise, surprise, they are taking our nighttime economy down with them here in Brisbane as well. Let's have a look at what happened in Sydney, where the lockout laws have had devastated the local economy. The new data from the City of Sydney has revealed that almost 500,000 fewer people under the age of 35 are visiting each year since lockout laws were introduced in 2014. There has been a 50 per cent reduction in the number of live music venues in Sydney, and we are seeing that starting to happen in Brisbane, as mentioned by Councillor Howard. There has been a 7 per cent reduction in the number of nighttime economy venues in the city centre, a 10 per cent decline in creative and performing arts businesses, the kinds of diverse businesses that we want to keep here in Brisbane and support. We know the people of Brisbane want diversity and choice when it comes to Brisbane's nightlife, and imposing ineffective lockout laws threatens these businesses and their potential to grow. It should be bleedingly obvious to state government by now that lockout law laws are disastrous to our nighttime economy, which is every bit as important to Brisbane, particularly as a tourism hub, as our daytime economy. Brisbane has the largest core nighttime economy in Australia along with the largest food and entertainment subsectors in Australia. Our nighttime economy employs 68,000 people, and we hear continually from those on the other side of the chamber <laughs> under the leadership of Councillor Cummings that they don't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Again. We hear the slurs thrown across the chambers from men on the other side bullying when they don't like what they hear. 
The food and beverage industry represents a mammoth 75 per cent of our nighttime economy. We cannot compete with the rest of Australia, let alone the rest of the world, if Labor turns our key entertainment precincts into ghost towns. Just like the unlucky operators on Caxton Street, these areas can only prosper in business-friendly environments, with the governments that back them, not that undermine their ability to operate. We know small businesses are the backbone of our economy. 80 per cent of businesses in Brisbane. And these lockout laws are doing more harm than good, an albatross around the neck of local businesses. If we don't support these businesses, our city comes to a grinding halt. Queensland's nighttime economy was previously growing faster than Victoria and New South Wales, but it has slowed in all numbers. Measures of establishments, employment and sales turnover are going backwards. These lockout laws cause more problems than they solve. We hear again tonight about the decrease in the violence between the hours of three and six, but what has Sydney shown? The laws don't curb the violence in the long run. It's not rocket science. Lockout laws encourage the concerning behaviour of preloading. We see 82 per cent of people having five to eight drinks before they even hit Brisbane's bars and clubs. Rather than showing up to our bars and clubs for a good night, they're already alcohol fueled, and the violence can be even worse. So much for addressing the irresponsible drinking and combating alcohol fueled violence. ID scanners force young people who have just been at home preloading to linger longer in the street and increase the risk of violence. Our city safe data actually shows that nighttime police requests have clearly increased from 2016 to 2019, a reversal in the trend. This is not the nighttime culture we want the people of Brisbane to enjoy. Meanwhile, back down south, King's Cross might have declined number of salts, but that's also because the number of overnight visitors has halved. If you walk down King's Cross this Saturday night, you'll be welcomed to a ghost town. The sad reality is that in the surrounding suburbs of King's Cross, domestic violence has increased 17 per cent. So despite the insistence from this state government to continually punish small businesses, they just don't get it. This administration is taking an evidence-based approach to the economy and the safety of our residents and visitors. We funded a second security operator in the city safe room and continue to maintain our city's 132 CCTV camera locations. We work with the police to keep these areas free of violence and drugs. We are ensuring accessible and safe late night public transport. We know what works. We're ensuring to see that there's more to do and see for people to get them out earlier into these precincts, like our Valley Fiesta program, which is a year-long program of live music focusing on our daytime economy leading into the night, earlier events in the precincts as well. Major events like Brisbane Festival and New Year's festivities attract tens of thousands of people to the city heart, and we are working hard to make sure that our calendar of events continue to increase the record influx of international and domestic visitors. Councillor Howard talked about the Fortitude um, Valley Music Hall, a new capacity of three, a venue with 3,000 people, a fantastic opportunity of more to see and do in the valley. The rezoning of the Caxton Street is definitely a step in the right direction, even if it is a little too late. But we will continue to pressure the state government to remove all lockout laws and make Brisbane safe. We welcome the opportunity to bring in sensible, evidence-based measures that benefit Brisbane and the people who live, work and play here. Removing the lockout laws would send a strong message that the state government truly values business operators, the hospitality sector and the food and beverages businesses. We don't want Brisbane to become a shadow of its former self, with no way of ever coming back to its glory days. We want the Brisbane of tomorrow to be even better than the Brisbane of today. Repeal these laws, back business and back Brisbane. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak briefly on the motion. Um, it's probably well known that the Greens are strongly opposed to lockout laws, and I'll be supporting this motion today. Um, I think the arguments have been well hashed out, and I, although it is interesting to hear both sides play a little fast and loose with statistics. I don't, don't want to drag this out too long, but I did want to remark on a couple of hypocrisies and contradictions I've heard in the debate. Um, I will say first off, though, that it's nice to hear the LNP also having a, having a shot at the New South Wales Liberal Party, and, and it, good on you for that. It's, it's um, important to acknowledge that 
both here in Queensland, the Labor state government has supported lock lockout laws, and south of the border, it's been the New South Wales Liberals who've supported lockout laws. So I don't think either of the major parties' hands are particularly clean in this. But uh, it, it's interesting to me that often in this place, when opposition councils bring motions, we're accused of grandstanding or it's all talk and no action or, oh, you're just bringing motions for the sake of it. Where's the substantive practical actions? Um, and yet this, is, this seems to be an exact example of that. And I'm sure later on tonight, the mayor or other councils will get up during the climate emergency debate and say, oh, what, this, is just mo this is just talk, this is just talk. Where's the action? So I, I do find that a little bit inconsistent. Hopefully um, that, that's a sign that this administration is changing its tack a little bit. Um, I just wanted to emphasise, though, that Brisbane City Council's hands are not clean when it comes to the failure to support the nighttime economy and the failure, in particular, to support the arts. On a regular basis, I hear complaints from venue operators, from musicians, from local event organisers that Council is un unreasonably strict and onerous in, in enforcing noise controls and noise limits for venues that have operated for a long time. I acknowledge that this is a complex issue and that there are some parts of the city that want to have peace and quiet, and there are some parts of the city that embrace a noisier, more vibrant nightlife. But this council has got the balance wrong. And, and I have, have had to weigh in and intervene on quite a few occasions where this council has tried to shut down um, non-profit community music venues that have the strong support of the local community, because this council's one-size-fits-all regulations don't value the arts and don't support local live music. And I say through you, Mr Chair, to all the, all the councillors here, um, this is, this is not, I'm not saying this to score political points. This is a serious issue where your administration is not flexible enough, it's not adaptive enough to local context, and it's one-size-fits-all rules are making it very, very difficult for local live music to prosper in this city outside of a few designated precincts. I think the current strategy needs re-evaluating, and I think that this council administration should engage more meaningfully with the live music community to ensure that we aren't just supporting a few mega venues in a few locations, but we, we can see a proliferation of good quality live music throughout the city. I, I think flowing on from that is if, if this council really was serious about supporting live music and, and supporting the nighttime economy, we'd also re-explore that earlier conversation I raised about rent controls and, and vacancy taxes, because it is really hard for those smaller venues to operate and remain sustainable when they are paying through the nose for, on commercial rents. So what we've seen in recent years in places like the Valley, um, but even before the lockout laws were introduced, is a consolidation of mega clubs where smaller venues are getting shut down and outcompeted by these bigger clubs that depend on massive booze sales and don't prioritise local live music. We've seen dance floor DJs replace live bands and we've seen a gen ge general erosion of the diversity of our live music scene. Now the live music community has resisted that actively and in some cases successfully and I think it's a testament to the Brisbane DIY music community of, how well they've, they've thrived and flourished despite the challenges placed on them by this administration. But if you are serious about supporting live music, if you're serious about supporting the nighttime economy, it's not just enough to shake your fist at the state government and complain about lockout laws because you have a lot of policy levers available to support local small businesses and to support live music here in the city, which you are not currently using. Flowing on from that, I think it's, it's particularly reprehensible to see the Liberal Party at all levels of government, but including here at Council, to continue to be so miserly and sparse in its funding of the arts. A single intersection upgrade ends up costing more than the Council's entire budget for supporting um, the performing and, and visual arts in this city. And I, I know there's a lot of stuff that, that Council supports and that happens in this city, but the amount of money we actually allocate towards supporting the arts, towards supporting li live music, is very, very small as a proportion of our entire budget. And if you wanted to support the nighttime economy, if you wanted to support our music scene, you would put more funding into great programs like City Sounds. You would ensure that those programs are running later into the evenings and in other locations. You would put more money into supporting community festivals so that event organisers don't have to do everything on a shoestring budget and shortchange their performers and shortchange their artists. This council has a huge budget and should be mobilising much more money in support of the live music scene. And that's what, you could, that, that's what would ensure that we have a diverse and strong nighttime economy.
If we want to, if we want to stop seeing those businesses close down, it's not enough to just say, oh, we're going to support laxer lockout laws where everyone can drink as much as possible. We also need to be proactive in supporting a diverse range of nighttime businesses so it's not just the mega clubs and so that venues have active incentives to support live music. There's a long list of things ca that can be done and it's disappointing that this council still takes such a hands-off approach. I'm feeling a little bit frustrated at the moment because I think sometimes for the arts community it feels like our calls are being um, falling on deaf ears and, and that the administration does igno doesn't acknowledge these problems, but they are serious and they are legitimate. This council has a bad reputation in many circles for being far too harsh on live music and being far too restrictive in terms of requiring development applications and change of use applications when a, a music venue wants to set up. I've had cafes that are trying to have a bit of live music just in the evenings told that they have to lodge a development application because they're not approved for amplified music. These are serious problems and when we're talking about lockout laws and when we're talking about impacts on nighttime economy, we need to be having a broader conversation about what more council can be doing rather than pointing at this one issue and saying that that's the source of all our problems. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Listen, uh, I've been listening closely to the uh, debate that's been going on and we heard a lot about the health of business uh, from that yes. side of the uh, chamber and we heard uh, a lot about the health of uh, live, uh, live entertainment from, uh, from Councillor Shri. But we didn't hear about the health of the patrons, the yes. patrons who actually go out to the venues yes. that, um, that would like to go out have a great time and go home safely and That's uninjured, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, fancy Councillor Murphy having a go at Anthony Lynham, Minister Lynham, about the great work that he did to try to put people back together yeah. that were impacted on these, um, on these venues, right? Uh, Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Murphy. Uh, claim to be misrepresented. It's noted, Councillor. I don't think I think I heard very very clearly that uh, Anthony Lydon was the one who, who actually brought these laws about. I don't think he was the only one. I remember many news reports about a number of deaths and a number of glassings and, and every other injury you could possibly think of. And they were interviewing people from the emergency departments of our hospitals, right? That had to deal with the carnage that was coming out prior to 2016. And I, I just find it unbelievable that this side of, that side of the chamber is only thinking about the health of business. Business, it's important. And the people that actually work in those businesses and own those businesses, yes, I agree, they're important, right? But more importantly is the health of the patron and why patrons are allowed in fully charged, fully drunk through the front door and then served at the bar is beyond me because I'm sure there's laws that, that uh, prohibit that, right? But obviously they still get more grog as they go in because you keep saying they're fully allowed before Chair. they even come Point into the venue precinct. Will Councillor Strunk take a question? No. Councillor Strunk, will you take a question? No. No, he won't. Okay. You had your short go, which took about eight minutes. Anyways, so I just, uh, I just don't, I just don't take your debate and the and the and the and the way you prosecuted the debate that it's just about the businesses, right? You haven't talked about the patrons, really, other than the fact that they should have a right to go in and get even more drunk. Yes. Because they're fully loaded with. Your words, not mine, fully loaded when they come in, right? No matter what time that is. So you, your, your debate or your, your, your reasoning behind this motion is, I, I believe, is not fully developed, Councillor Murphy. And you should have talked about the health of the, of the patrons as well, which you did not do. So to my way of thinking, you don't really care about them. You don't care if they get injured. You don't care if they end up in the hospital. Councillor Strunk, can you please direct comments to the chair? Thank you, Mr. Chair, I will through your chair to Councillor Murphy. You don't really care about the patrons and how they get injured. You don't care no, if so, in some cases uh, they do. Can, can you please refer to Councillor Murphy in the third person? In the what Re person? Can, can you refer comments th through to me? You can't just say through you and then return to saying you. Yeah, you have to say through you, Councillor Murphy. Okay, through you, to Mr. Councillor chair, Murphy. to Councillor Murphy, right? Yeah. I don't believe your argument is really has much credence really simply because you're only caring about the businesses you're not in carry you're not caring about the patrons that actually um, attend those uh, attend those venues right and you don't really care about what happens to them in some instances 
when they become, uh, get in an altercation, right, and end up in hospital. We didn't hear any of that at all from any of the speakers on the other side. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? Oh, excuse me, yeah, Councillor Murphy, your misrepresentation. Please uh, limit your comments to the substance of the matter. Councillor Murphy. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Strunk said that uh, I was uh, having a go at uh, Minister Lynham for putting people's faces back together. I wasn't. I was uh, having a go at using that as a basis to form a policy. Right, there being no further speakers, um, uh, Councillor Murphy, your right of reply. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair, and I thank uh, all councillors for their contribution uh, to this debate. Uh, despite the fact that it got a little bit heated in the middle there, um, obviously it's an issue uh, which inspires uh, passions uh, on both sides of the debate, um, particularly uh, after uh, one uh, what, will, what will now become famous evening at the opening of the Fortitude, uh, which will be forever preserved in the minutes of Brisbane City Council meetings. Um, Look, can I just commence by uh, addressing this, this issue uh, of uh, percentages uh, in which, with which uh, reports of, of violence uh, has decreased? Uh, Councillor Cumming uh, quoted uh, I, this same statistic that Councillor Cassidy uh, did and then Councillor Strunk did as well. Um, I've got Google. I can Google the latest Career Mail article about the lockout laws as well. Um, but what you really need to do, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Strunk, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming, is actually go and read uh, the report that the government commission that was released by um, uh, Deakin University and by the University uh, of Queensland, because while it does say that there was a 29 per cent drop in uh, alcohol-related violence uh, between the hours of 3 a.m. to 6, uh, 6 a.m., which is a three-hour window, at the end of the lockout, when most patrons have already gone home, there's been a 19% increase, which actually is weird. None of you mentioned that 90% increase in violent incidences from 8 p.m. to midnight. And do you, when do you think there's more people in the valley, between 8 p.m. and midnight or 3 a.m. to 6 a.m.? So lies, damn lies, and statistics, Mr. Chairman, uh, that you won't hear those opposite talk about the volume of incidents, you will hear them talk about the percentage that it's dropped because they, they know that the volume is about triple. Uh, there's triple the amount of people in the valley during the hours of 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. And they know that that means there's actually more incidences occurring as a result of these lockout laws when you wash it all through the system. So they really have been a failure and don't let the government release statistics which were handed to the Career Mail fool you or make you think anything otherwise, because that is uh, just a complete falsehood. Now, we also had Councillor uh, Cassidy um, talk about his experience uh, there at the Fortitude on Friday night. He had a go at us for being invited by the owners of the Fortitude, uh, by uh, Scott Hutchinson, a strong union supporter. I don't know why Councillor Cassidy, as a good union man, wouldn't have got a ticket to that event. Uh, maybe it's the fact that the Labor Party bagged the crap out of everyone that operates entertainment venues in the city. You could hear Councillor Cummings saying, oh, did Louis Bickle give you an invite? Was that Louis Bickle's money? And the last time we debated this issue, they accused us of being shills for the alcohol and entertainment industry. So is it any wonder they don't get invited to these events because they attack these businesses every time this comes to this chamber, every single time. And look, I, I don't know, Councillor Cassie then, he called me the king of the kids and then said I'd failed in becoming the king of the kids. So I don't know what that's about, that's weird. Um, look, uh, Councillor Shree, uh, he, uh, he talked about the New South Wales Liberals and the fact that you know, it's nice to, to see uh, us criticise them. I have always been on the record as saying the lockout laws down there uh, have not worked. The stats down there were actually the stats we used to prove that the lockout laws wouldn't work. Here in Queensland, we said, look, uh, the stats in Newcastle show that uh, the same thing that they have shown in Queensland, that it doesn't actually reduce incidences of alcohol-related violence, but it does move them to outside the time periods and outside the precincts where they're not captured by police data and they're not subject uh, to the same kind of uh, support in policing and in chaplaincy uh, that we do have available in safe night out precincts. Um, he also made some comments uh, around 
uh, supporting uh, live music and some additional, uh, I think, uh, liberalisation around uh, that support for the arts. I mean, we can all uh, agree on that in generalities, but um, you know, I'm, I would be happy to see specific proposals uh, come before the chamber. Uh, and of course, uh, he spoke about um, the inflexibility of DAs when it comes to live music. This is something I actually agree with him on. Uh, a lot of the time I've found uh, that officers within uh, council's uh, development assessment department will be uh, clamping down on live music venues as a result of conditions within their liquor license application, which is a state government thing, and, and council has not afforded a lot of flexibility, or actually any flexibility, to go outside the boundaries of the liquor license application. So um, that is an, an issue that I've taken up um, in the past, and uh, I don't believe that the Queensland government is uh, very flexible when it comes to those uh, liquor license uh, conditions. They certainly haven't shown that in the past. Um, so, look, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'm still doing that one. Mr. Chair, uh, I thank all councillors for their contribution. I uh, thank uh, those who will support this motion. Uh, I have tried to be, um, and Councillor Adams has tried to be, uh, as bipartisan as possible in the framing of this motion so as to be able uh, to have all councillors uh, support it, and I certainly urge uh, everyone to do so. Excuse me. Um, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Councillor Cumming. Division. Division on Councillor Strunk. Uh, ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Clarks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour and five against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Councillors, before we begin the next item, uh, as the time is nearing 9 p.m., the meeting will automatically stand adjourned unless we agree to continue the sitting. Is it the will of this council that this sitting uh, proceed beyond 9 p.m.? All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw your attention to the notice of motion item 8B. Councillor Shree, would you move the motion, please? Mr Chair, I move that Brisbane City Council acknowledges that climate change will negatively impact Brisbane, including by exposing parts of our city to coastal inundation as sea levels rise, exposing residents to more frequent extreme weather events like heat waves, cyclones and floods, 
significantly increase in daytime temperatures so that being outside becomes unbearable during the summer months, increasing the risk of food and water shortages. In response to the above, Brisbane City Council declares that our city and Australia are facing a climate emergency and commits to publicly declaring a climate emergency, urgently develop a comprehensive citywide climate emergency action plan to inform policy development to mitigate and adapt to climate change, to reduce emissions and draw down carbon using solutions that uphold and strengthen the rights of First Nations communities, to roll out a major public education campaign to raise awareness about the climate crisis and its solutions, call on other local, state and national governments to mobilise at speed to address the climate emergency and deliver climate justice, and to support a just transition of our economy away from industries that exacerbate climate change. Is there a seconder? Seconded for the purposes of debate. Seconded by Councillor Johnston. Councillor Sri, would you please... Um, uh, the, excuse me, it's been moved by Councillor Sri, seconded by Councillor Johnston, that the, the motion as read be, uh, be moved. Councillor Shree, would you please speak to the motion? Thanks, Mr Chair. And, um, in speaking on this motion, I need to start by acknowledging the First Nations communities, Pacifica communities and people of colour in vulnerable, low-lying coastal cities around the world who are experiencing um, the most severe negative impacts of climate change already and recognising that right now Pacific Island nations are already planning their relocation strategies, that the water is literally already lapping at the door and that it is very likely over coming decades that if climate change is not addressed, we will see millions and potentially hundreds of millions of climate refugees displaced. I also want to acknowledge that it's those First Nations and Pacifica communities that have been on the front line of the campaigns for climate justice. And then when we're talking about transitioning into a more sustainable society, we have a lot to learn from those communities about how to live in balance with the natural world. The motion before us is reasonably straightforward. It starts by acknowledging some of the significant negative impacts that climate change will have on our city of Brisbane and goes on to declare a climate emergency and, and commits to a few specific actions that flow from that. Climate change is very much a local issue and I'm, I'm sure all councils agree with that to some extent, but it's worth outlining some of the um, most obvious and significant negative impacts that climate change is likely to have upon our city. In particular, there's going to be an increase to coastal and creek flooding. Residential properties in low-lying areas are going to be more vulnerable to estuarine and creek flooding as well as coastal flooding, particularly during st storm surges and as a result of severe weather events. We're likely to see heavier storms and possibly even more frequent cyclones in southeast Queensland. We're likely to have hotter neighbourhoods with more people dying in heat waves, more droughts and rainfall shortages. And of course, that's going to have a lot of negative flow and impacts for us here in Council. We've already seen the number of street trees that die when there's a, a shortage of rain, but we're also going to see severe interruptions to our food supply. We're going to see severe in potential interruptions to our water supply in the future. These are serious and significant negative impacts. And so to anyone who says that climate change is not a local issue, I encourage you to look at the facts and understand that this is very much a local issue and very much something that all local councils should be seriously concerned about. We're even going to see increasing construction costs as a, as a result of construction material scarcity and the reduced working hours that's, that's possible outdoors. But perhaps most significantly, we're going to see, see severe economic impacts because so many industries, so many jobs upon which Brisbane residents depend are going to be less viable and less secure and in a rapidly changing climate. And I guess the, the, the reason I'm bringing this motion, or part of the reason I'm bringing this motion and part of the substance of this motion is that Brisbane City Council can do so much more to take action on climate change. Part of the motion talks about developing a comprehensive citywide climate emergency action plan. Now that would go a lot further than the previous climate change strategies that this administration has adopted. And I've, I've read them and I acknowledge that there's some good stuff in there, but we have a long, long way to go. I don't have time to give you a complete list, but. Um, for anyone who think, any councillors here who think this council administration is doing enough, please take note that we are, we are no longer a world leader if we ever were, and there is far more we can, do it, we can be doing. In particular, and as a, as a bare, minimum, we, man, bare minimum, we should stop clearing trees, and we should, stop, uh, we should um, provide greater maintenance and protection of, of existing vegetation, both on public land and on private properties. I get very frustrated when I continually see this council approve developers to 
knock down established trees and then replace them with tiny saplings and say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, we did that, yeah. We knocked down this big 100-year-old fig tree, but over here we planted a few saplings, so that's fine, no tree clearing to see here. That happens all the time in this place, and this administration doesn't have a sincere commitment to reforestation and protecting our natural assets. Other simple things, like the fact that this council has still not contributed, con committed to ensuring that the new metro vehicles will not rely on fossil fuels. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on those new vehicles, and it's very concerning that mayor, the mayor still won't commit to ensuring that those vehicles are not fossil fuel powered. We can, of course, reduce the use of concrete in concept council construction projects and also in, in private developments. I think many residents don't understand that cement is a major contrib contributor fo to fossil fuel emissions globally and that that needs some serious thinking around what alternative construction materials we can shift to. I think in particular the council could be doing a lot more to support the growing of food locally and having seen how some of the community gardens in my electorate have to jump through a lot of hoops just to get support to plant a few veggies. It's obvious to me that this council should be doing a lot more to support um, urban farming within the city footprint so that we are more resilient and so that we are well prepared when there are food shortages due to natural disasters in our region. We also as a council need to stop supporting airport runway expansions and cruise ship terminal construction. We don't talk about these issues enough, but air travel is a major contributor to fossil fuel emissions. And instead, we should be supporting new high-speed rail between major cities and towns. That's the way forward. That's how we move people around our region. And the fact that this council continues to support airport expansions is deeply concerning. In, in particular, though, we need this council to shift to 100% green energy. The administration's statements around this in the past have been somewhat confusing and contradictory. But my understanding is that we still continue to produce a lot a lot of fossil fuel emissions and then say, oh, don't worry, we're offsetting it. We've given some money to some company overseas to plant some trees that we haven't really looked closely at, but trust us, it's offsets, it's fine. What we should be doing is shifting this council to 100% renewable energy by 2025. That's an ambitious target, but it is entirely achievable. Yes, that will mean that some of our operations have to change. Yes, that will mean we have to change, change the way we do some things, but we need to do it. Um, but in particular, when I think about what more this city could be doing, I think particularly of our sustainable urban planning and sustainable transport. We are still designing buildings that are very energy intensive, that aren't climate appropriate, that are highly reliant on air conditioning, that are not comfortable to live in without using a lot of electricity. But more than that, our transport networks and the, our land use planning continues to prioritise car use. And it is this administration's continued focus on widening roads, on spending hundreds of millions of dollars on road projects that encourage more people to drive, which clearly demonstrates to me that this administration is not genuinely committed to climate change action. We should be supporting stronger public transport networks, wa walking, cycling to get around, so that people have an alternative to driving everywhere. And this administration has made some small steps in that direction, but when you look at the policies and the decisions that council officers are making on a daily basis, we are still not going anywhere near far enough to support that transition. Fossil fuel emissions from motor vehicles are one of the major contributors to climate change. And if this council is serious about climate action, it's not enough to say, oh, don't worry, our administration's buying green energy, our, our buses are, are run sustainably. We actually need to ensure that residents are supported to transition how they move around our city as well. But more than all that, I think this emergency motion is important because it signals to politicians at high levels of government and also to the wider public that we can't um, continue with business as usual if we are to prevent catastrophic climate change. Business as usual is not compatible with a stable society and with human flourishing long term. We need to fundamentally rethink the underlying assumptions of the way our society is structured and governed. It means we stop pursuing economic growth for its own sake and start focusing on improving people's quality of life. It means we prioritise community and sustainability ahead of corporate profits. And we recognise that our actions here in this city and in this country have far-reaching negative impacts on people in other parts of the world who have very little agency to take action. I know there are a lot of people who seem to argue that oh, Australia doesn't emit anywhere near as much as, as China or India, therefore there's no point in us taking action. But actually it is Australian coal that's being burned overseas, which is a major contributor to fossil fuel emissions and accelerating climate change. So rather than getting all hung up on exactly what Australians are doing right here locally, we need to recognise that our coal exports are, are rapidly exacerbating climate change. 
and that we have a moral duty to shift our economy away from dependence on those resource extractive industries and to support those regional coal towns to transition to sustainable industries. We are lying right now to coal workers in regional towns when we tell them that they will have secure jobs in coal for 50, 50, 60 years. We need to support them to transition with free education, with retraining programs, so that we can have a sustainable future. And I think that's really the ultimate message here is that action on climate change doesn't mean that we all have to live in caves by candlelight. It doesn't mean we have to have a reduced quality of life but it does mean making some changes now so that future generations can continue to enjoy a high quality life and don't have to deal with the negative impacts of frequent natural disasters, of food shortages and famines, of hundreds of millions of displaced people. We have to act now, and that's why this climate emergency declaration is so important. We've seen Sydney City Council, Melbourne City Council, a whole range of councils around Australia. Noosa City Council has recently declared a climate emergency motion. And tonight, I understand even Darwin City Council became the 30th major council in Australia to declare a climate emergency motion. And it, is very, very, it will be very, very disappointing if this council doesn't follow suit and recognise how serious this issue is and send a message to the people of Brisbane that Councilor we care Shree, and we are acting. Are there further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Okay, I guess um, the Lord Mayor said he wasn't going to support it this morning on radio, and that means he's not even going to debate it. Uh, I seconded the motion um, uh, when Councillor Street asked me. Um, I don't quite agree with everything that's in the motion, and he's he's aware of that. Um, however, what I do want to say is that I um, recognise and support the action that council has taken uh, to date. Um, but the idea that the LNP um, wants people to believe is that it's, it's job done, tick. Um, we've, we've done everything we need to do. Um, there's no climate problems here. Uh, and, you know, you know, walk on by. It's, we've got it all under control. Um, clearly, that's not the case. And it is my opinion that uh, there is more that we can be doing. Uh, to address the issues of climate change and its impact on our city and our local communities. And it's for that reason, um, despite my um, concern with the motion itself, uh, that I was prepared to second it and um, I'll, I'll be putting forward an amendment uh, to try and change it a little bit. Um, uh, I certainly want Council to take more action, um, completely take more action. And uh, I think what I'll do is move my amendment and I'll speak to that. Uh, and uh, we'll see if, um, I don't know if anybody will support my amendment, um, but uh, one of my concerns has been that the language in this motion um, before us today is, is quite political. Um, it is inflammatory, which I think is a concern. There's, the language is um, uh, very much, I think, um, concerning in the way that it is expressed, um, but there are very good concepts contained within it and I'd like to move uh, the following amendment. That the following words are deleted, um, including by dot point exposing parts of our city to coastal inundation as sea levels rise, uh, second dot point exposing residents to more frequent extreme weather events like heat waves, cyclones and floods dot point, significantly increasing daytime temperatures so that being outside becomes unbearable in, during summer months, dot point, increasing the risk of flood and water shortages. Two, in response to the above, Brisbane City Council declares that our city and Australia are facing a climate emergency, dot point, publicly declare a climate emergency, uh, dot point, call on other local, state and national governments to mobilise at speed to address the climate emergency and deliver climate justice. Dot point, support a transition, just transition of our economy away from industries that exacerbate climate change, so that the motion will now read, and these are the words from the original motion put forward by Councillor Shree, expressed in a different way and a shorter form. Brisbane City Council acknowledges that climate change will negatively impact Brisbane and commits to 
urgently develop a comprehensive citywide climate emergency action plan to inform policy development and mitigate and adapt to climate change, to reduce emissions and draw down carbon using solutions that uphold and strengthen the rights of First Nations communities, and dot point, roll out a major public education campaign to raise awareness about the climate crisis and its solutions. And I move that amendment. Seconded. Is there a seconder, Councillor Griffiths? Um, so I have a, um, an amendment motion in front of me in writing, moved by Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Councillor Johnston, to your amendment, please. Uh, uh, yes, thank amendment. you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, there are a number of statements in the motion that I, I, I don't agree with. Um, and I just want to place on the record my concern with them. And I don't know, I think it is a, a problem of expression, um, but essentially what the motion is doing is it's not actually declaring a climate emergency. Um, it was saying that we're committing to declaring a climate emergency. And two, there is a, a dot point in here that says um, that we support a just transition of our economy away from industries that exacerbate climate change. Now, almost every aspect of human existence, everything we see and do, me speaking here today, is generating, um, uh, is generating carbon, is contributing to uh, climate change. Um, you know, by saying we're going to transition our economy away from industries that exacerbate climate change, we're saying we're going to stop going to work, we're going to stop living in houses, we're going to stop building houses. We heard the lady that this afternoon, we're, going to yeah. we're using our air conditioners, we're going to stop. If the intent of this motion was to say we're going to transition away from mining, that's not what it says. So I, I won't go on with the semantics of all of this because, again, my purpose here is to say I support our council doing more on climate change. However, I do not support um, the content and wording of the motion that has been put forward uh, for debate. Um, but I strongly support the need for our council to do more. Um, and I believe that the good points in the motion that were put forward um, are that we develop a citywide climate emergency action plan. This council did start doing that about 15 years ago yeah. and pretty much has, has stopped. Um, and Councillor Shree's outlined a number of um, uh, issues and there's certainly many of those I agree with him on. Um, this council, when I started, used to talk about um, uh, generating electricity. Um, it was something that I remember I went to a meeting with Councillor McLaughlin when I was his deputy, um, and it was one of the issues that we used to talk about, how we would generate um, electricity, particularly from waste or you know, other sources. That conversation's just stopped. I mean, we are capturing um, methane over at Rochdale, but I don't think there's been any increase to that or any rollout of that or any way to expand that. Um, and, and energy production from um, our council is absolutely one thing that we should be looking at, uh, looking at. We've got some solar panels on the roofs of some council building, but I don't know that we have a comprehensive plan to roll out um, capturing solar and incorporating solar into the delivery of our uh, energy. But I think that is something that clearly this council's having a bit of a go at, but we haven't got a cohesive plan. And I think we should, because we've taken a step in the right direction. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I don't think this council could quantify exactly how much of its energy, because I've asked in committee previously, how much of its energy is actually being produced from renewables. It's so small in the discussions that we've had in the committee um, previously um, that they can't quantify it. We're paying, as Councillor Shree did outline, um, overseas companies for offsets. Yes. That's how this company, uh, council is justifying the fact that we're carbon neutral. That, that's a lazy way of going about addressing change. Um, we need to do that through proactive measures that contribute um, sustainably to the way in which our council operates. Now, um, I think there's more we can do in the waste area. Waste is obviously um, you know, a big issue. And our council, again, has taken a leading role on recycling, um, but I think there is more that we can do in this space. Um, tree clearing and, and development, absolutely two areas where we should be uh, looking from a planning point of view uh, as to what uh, we're doing. Um, there is, the first thing that any developer does when they buy a block is go and knock down every tree on the site. Yeah, yeah. That has to stop. We could stop that. Yeah. These are big mature trees usually. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, it's a no-brainer that we should have that in our planning scheme. Um, and yes, the state government have a role to play here with uh, development as well. Um, but houses aren't required to have solar panels or new houses. Yeah, our, our design and city plan requirements don't require um, water tanks or you know other measures. Again, when I started, um, we used to help households. We used to help households um, to address sustainability measures, and that's trickled away. Um, we used to have water tank subsidies. It stopped. Um, we used to have electricity um, initiatives like the power boards to help you reduce your power. Those subsidies stopped. Um, we used to do a lot of things, and they've just died out. I mean, composting seems to be the latest thing we'll try for a couple of years. Cheap. Yeah, um, you know uh, whether it should be incorporated more fully into our waste um, program for collection to help um, that goal we have, an admirable goal of zero waste to landfill. Um, but again, we're just having a little tiny go at it on the side, and all of the things that should be just an every ongoing part of our program to help households address climate change are not even being considered. I mean, this council won't even consider a fruit tree in a park or on a street. I mean, wouldn't that be great? I get residents ask me all the time, and I think probably there are some parks where it won't be suitable, but there is absolutely no reason why we can't plant some fruit trees in some of our parks so that people can go down to their local park and pick a piece of fruit. Those things aren't being considered. So I believe there's more we can do as a council in our operations, and I believe there is more we can do to support uh, households. And I have noted that some 600 councils you know, around um, the world, and I had thought 26 in Australia, but I gather that's up to 30 now, um, have already done this. And I don't think we should be scared by um, the word climate emergency. I, it's a little bit inflammatory, but the intent of it is to say we need to do more to address climate change, and that is um, something that I support. Um, I just want to say that if Darwin can do it, not known necessarily for its progressive you know, um, approach, I would have thought, but if Darwin can do it, then Brisbane can do it. And if every capital city in Australia does this, and Brisbane is the only one to vote against it, which is highly likely as to what's going to happen tonight, that would be a terrible reflection upon a council that says how proud it is um, to, to uh, you know, take the running on climate change. So Sydney, Melbourne, um, Darwin, I'm not sure where Adelaide is up to, but I'd say it's highly likely that they're going to do it, if not already. Um, Perth, I don't know. Um, Canberra, for sure, probably already has. ACT Parliament. ACT Parliament already has, the Territory has. We might be the only capital city in Australia that hasn't supported a statement on climate change. So I don't know if the Liberals have got, or the LNP, have got um, an amendment of their own ready to go, um, but I've put something forward that has uh, less of the colourful language of um, the politics associated with this issue, and I would hope that everyone could support a more simplified version of this. Um, that essentially reflects two things that Council does. One, which is develop an action plan, and two, which is to develop a community, um, a community education campaign to work with our residents. And I urge all councillors to support the amendment. Further speakers? Uh, yes. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. And uh, I rise to support uh, this amended motion. Um, it's really finding a compromise I believe, finding a compromise between the Liberal stance of do nothing and Councillor Shree's stance of it's very dramatic and the world's going to end and if it doesn't end, we're all going to die and rah rah. So I think there's a compromise here between those two stances. Um, it's very catastrophic, Councillor Shree. I think you mentioned catastrophic, you mentioned emergency. You mentioned uh, that we've got to stop travelling by international planes to anywhere else, and we've got to stop the cruise industry. I think most people in Brisbane would not accept that. Um, I think they don't agree with that. But it's good that you're putting those ideas out here. So I'm rising to present the ALP's position um, as representative of the Parks, Environment and Sustainability Committee. Point of order, Mr Chair. Yes. Is this not the debate on whether we accept the amendment? It is. That's right. It's still the amendment debate. 
This is the amend amended. Yep. This is the so, amendment. So just, 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 just so people understand, we're debating the amendment proposed by Councillor Johnston yes. and Councillor Griffiths as a seconder is speaking to the amendment, yes. not the amended motion, just yeah, in case. The so that's where we are. Yeah, right? yeah. I'm speaking to the amendment. Um, and one of the things I stand proudly um, here tonight and with my colleagues is that the Labor Party has a very strong record of acknowledging and dealing with the issue of climate change. And from the beginning, it's been the Labor Party that's acknowledged the science of climate change and that is due to human activity. And the science has been repeated and it's in. And the fact that we as humans are generating this climate change uh, means that we as humans need to be dealing with it because its impact is not only on our world and our, our planet, um, it's also on human health, significantly on human health, significantly on human activity and significantly on us as a planet into the future. I was interested tonight and it's the first time I've actually heard a councillor from that side of the chamber and correct me if I'm wrong, I heard councillor Hammond actually say the words climate change and I haven't heard that from that side of the chamber for a very long time. It's been something that's been ignored, something that hasn't been uttered, but something that this LNP administration have been working towards. And I've always thought it's a silly thing not to be able to say the word climate change. Um, but let's look at some of the history with regards to climate change, because the history helps us understand what's happening here. We know that in some nations there's actually been a bipartisan approach to climate change and they've achieved really clear and, and distinct actions very quickly. And if we look at our neighbours, New Zealand, we look at the UK, or look at Germany, they've had results because they've had a bipartisan approach. Unfortunately in Australia we haven't had a bipartisan approach and it's been a very fraught argument and it's been a very negative argument for our community. And in 2006, the Liberal Coalition government did not ratify the Kyoto Agreement. But when they lost office, Rudd and the Labor government came in and did ratify it. And the story goes on, that conflict goes on, and it's been going on for a long time. But in 2009, the Liberal National Party government under Abbott, sided with the Greens to join forces to actually defeat Labor's carbon pollution reduction scheme. And I want to say that really clearly because it was actually, Councillor Shree, your party that got rid of our opportunity in 2009 to do something about climate change and it's when I lost so much respect for your party in terms of doing something about this issue in a genuine way. So I find it quite interesting that we're here tonight having a climate emergency when your very party voted down our opportunity to do something in 2009. And I hear in groans, Councillor Shri, but that's a fact. So it was a missed opportunity for our environment, for our economy, for business and for our citizens as well as for the country. And it's a disappointing result for the country. And it's interesting that just in the last couple of weeks, the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet, mm. Dr Martin Parker, has actually come out, so his head of the Liberal National Party, Prime Minister and Cabinet, has come out and he's actually said that power prices would be lower now if an emission trading scheme had been implemented a decade ago. So he's the Liberal National Party's own person in, uh, in Prime Minister and Cabinet. And the whole scheme could have been done much cheaper. And the debate continues and the groaning from Councillor Shri continues. But suddenly we have a climate emergency that has to be dealt with and we have to have people in the streets gluing themselves to the road because the world's going to end. 
Well, it was un in 2006 that under an ALP majority, and it was an ALP majority council, but there was a Liberal Point Lord Mayor, a motion Point was- Point of order to you, Councillor Hammond. Um, I believe the moaning from Councillor Shree might be because this is not about the amendment. It is about the amendment. So it's, a, it's a good speech, but it's not about the amendment. Um, you had the opportunity to say something. You said no, nothing. Hang on. You've been Can't sitting be there Councillor Griffiths, there's still, there's still a long way to go in this debate, I suspect. So, I suspect look, so look, too. I, um, uh, I, I think that you're largely sticking to the content of the motion, so please continue. Thank you. So what I want to go back to my point before I was interrupted. In 2006, under, sorry. Now, come on. No, 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 no. Look, what, I don't know why after 9 p.m., every time we go past 9 p.m., people start to get a bit frayed. All right. So can everyone please <laughs> remind themselves that they are Brisbane City Councillors and that courtesy okay, and respect for each other is fundamental to this role. Thank you, Mr. Griffiths. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So under, in 2006, under an ALP majority in this chamber, um, we brought in a motion that Brisbane City Council acknowledges climate change and sustainability. And that has been the foundation of everything that Council has done since, in terms of Council becoming a, a, a carbon neutral organisation, which it did in 2017. And it was good to hear the speaker tonight recognising that. So there are some positive things. But as in this motion, there's plenty more to do. And what I like about this motion is it simplifies things. That we agree to do a comprehensive action plan that residents can see, that looks at how we reduce emissions and um, draw down our carbon, using solutions that strengthen the rights of First Nation people. So yes, agree with that. And the second thing is roll out a major education campaign to raise awareness about climate crisis and its solution. So we think this is a concrete way of going. We think it's a way of showing this council is committed to what we're doing. And we think there's much more that this council can do. And previously, by the two previous speakers, one of the things that we can do better is actually buying our carbon credits from Australian uh, projects and reducing the amount of land clearing. And I need to look no further than Polara in my electorate at all the land clearing that's going on there under this administration. So we believe that that would then be about reporting on our actions and having annual targets that we can see and about offering hope by talking positively about climate change. And I would say move away from the drama, move away from the negative language and actually offer our city and our people some hope. So, yes, Councillor Shri, we are supporting this motion. We believe that this motion is the way to go. It's a compromise, but it actually sets a clear target about how to deal with a climate emergency in a practical way. And I would encourage you and everyone in the chamber to support this motion. Thank you. Further speakers to the amendment? The, oh, Councillor Shri. Thanks. I rise to speak on the proposal to amend the motion I initially brought to this chamber. Um, and just for the purposes of the 100 or so people who are watching at home, just so you understand what's going on, the independent councillor and the Labor councillor are basically watering down the motion a little bit. So the amendment seeks to remove the parts of the motion that acknowledge the severe negative impacts that climate change may have on our city. So the amendment is removing all the acknowledgements that climate change is going to expose our city to flooding and to heat waves, et cetera, et cetera. The amendment also removes the public declaration of a climate emergency. And I'll, I'll correct you on that, Councillor Johnston, because the original motion said that in response to the above, Brisbane City Council declares that our city and Australia are facing a climate emergency. And I think your amendment actually removes that declaration. But either way, I think also removing the um, call to support a just transition of our economy away from industries that exacerbate climate change is pretty obvious and crucial to this whole motion. So I won't support amending it, but if, if it turns out that this is the best chance for this motion to get through, if, if the amendment goes through, I'll still vote in favour of that because something is better than nothing. But um, really the whole point of this motion is that declaration of a climate emergency and recognising how serious this issue is. And I don't want to harp on all night because I know it's late, but councillors in this chamber seem to be um, a little bit naive to, the, to, to what's going on here. It's like, oh yeah, we acknowledge climate change is real. We, we acknowledge it's a problem and look, we're gonna take some steps. 
But it seems like a, a lot of councillors in this place and, and um, the political establishment more generally simply aren't grappling with the severity of this issue. It's, it's like you acknowledge that it's a problem, but you don't recognise how much of a problem it is. And for Councillor Griffiths from the Labor Party to talk about um, my, my, to suggest that my emotion was engaging in some form of hyperbole or that I was too alarmist or whatever, I think completely misses the point that this is an alarming issue and that we should be treating it as an emergency. We should be really concerned about the impacts that this is going to have, not just on our region, but around the world. And, and so I guess I'm, I, I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed that um, the independent Labor councillors are proposing to water down the motion, but it, it seems like the Liberals aren't even going to speak to the thing at all, which says a lot about their contempt for the, for the people of Brisbane who are concerned about this issue. And so I'll, I'll speak in, again in wrapping up later, but um, I just want to reiterate the fact that um, declaring an emergency is about recognising that we understand the severity of this issue and that we are signalling to the people of Brisbane this is important and that requires serious action. And so if we water it down to simply say, oh, we're going to roll out a public education campaign and, and develop the emergency action plan, but we're not making that declaration, I think that does send the wrong signal to the broader public and to the nation as a whole. So I would much prefer that Brisbane City Council joins those 30 other councils around Australia, including Darwin, Sydney, Melbourne, Noosa, Byron, etc., and declares an emergency. And I don't want this council to be the one major city council in Australia that, that fails to do so, because I think that would be a real lost opportunity. So I won't support this amendment, but if, it, if, it, if this is all that's going to get through, then I guess we'll have no choice but to vote on it. Uh, further speakers to the amendment? Councillor Johnston, you're right to reply. Okay, for those following along at home, uh, I've moved an amendment to the um, to the motion, which uh, uh, two councillors have spoken to. That's uh, Councillor uh, Griffith for the Labor Party, who has said he supports my amendment, and Councillor Shri uh, from the Greens, who doesn't, which I guess is quite understandable given he moved the uh, original motion. The Liberal National Party councillors have still not spoken either about the substantive motion put forward by Councillor Shree nor about um, the amendment that I've put forward. Now, the amendment that I've put forward, um, I know Councillor Shree, uh, I, I did give it to him earlier this afternoon, is, is not his cup of tea, and I can understand that. Um, uh, but what I've sought to do is to acknowledge that this council recognises that climate change will never negatively impact on Brisbane and commits to take action. Um, that is, by developing a climate emergency action plan yes. and two, a public um, education campaign uh, with our uh, residents. So I would have thought this is right up the LNP's alley. Um, it takes out a lot of the language that I know they wouldn't have supported at all. Um, and secondly, uh, it talks about things that as a council, um, we've done a little bit of, but in my view, very strongly, we should be doing more of. And I'm disappointed that yet again, for the, again those watching at home, this is the normal, um, this is the normal sort of course of action by the LNP that I'll move a motion in this place, which I do regularly, and they don't even speak to it, and then they just come along and they'll vote it down, um, unless by some kind of miracle <laughs> they're going to support it, which I don't believe they will. Um, I'll come back to my position on this matter again and say. Um, I'm disappointed that the LNP won't even engage in the debate. Um, I think that's a very sad reflection of the fact that they're not prepared to debate uh, an amendment and a motion. Uh, two, um, I believe that as a council we should be doing more. Um, I want to put on the record um, my concerns with the original motion and the language that's in it, um, but to coin Councillor Shree's, uh, Councillor Shree's um, uh, comment from earlier, something is better than nothing. Um, so I will support the substantive motion if that is all that is on the table before us today. However, I want to put on um, the record my extreme concern about the last dot point, which in my view pretty much means that we're going to stop living as human beings on the planet because it does not in any way, shape or form talk specifically about what transition relates to. 
Um, and you know, I know, and I think most people, I think all people would know, that pretty much all human activity, habitation is contributing to climate change. So we can't just shut ourselves down. So, you know, I have some real concerns with not just the language but the substance of some of the ideas that are put forward. Um, but again, I support our council doing more on climate change. I do not want to be the only city in Australia or the only capital city, um, you know, in in uh, in Australia that doesn't support uh, a climate action statement. Um, and I hope this is not going to be like the straws and all the other stuff. That in about a month's time they'll realise, oh shit, we really should have done something about this, and then they'll take the idea and they'll try and sell it as their own because. You know that's very lazy politics when you have the opportunity uh, to debate the issue right here and now, and you aren't. So I just want to again encourage all councillors to support the amendment. Um, it basically acknowledges that climate change is negatively impacting on our city. It urges us to develop a citywide climate emergency action plan and to roll out a major public education campaign to address the impacts of climate change. I feel it's a, a good compromise. Um, it's something I'd be very happy to support. Um, I'll obviously be moving it, um, and I hope all councillors will support it so that we can have, um, you know, a debate about uh, the amended motion. All those in favour of the amendment say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Call by Seconded. Johnson and Councillor Griffiths. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Clarks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being five in favour, 18 against and one abstention. The noes have it. Please return to your chairs. We'll now return to the substantive motion as presented in the papers. Further speakers, Councillor Murphy. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on this motion calling on Council to declare a climate emergency. Uh, as the Lord Mayor stated earlier today, administration councillors won't uh, be supporting this motion. There's a number of reasons uh, that I would like to go into uh, as to why. Before I do that, I want to be clear about the reasons that we would have liked to have supported a motion like this. Earlier today, Councillor Hammond spoke at length about Council's achievements in this space, and um, I can assure you I don't propose to go over them again for the benefit of the Chamber. Um, but suffice to say that this administration uh, does believe in anthropogenic global warming, and we've taken significant steps uh, to combat it, very significant steps. 
and we plan for the eventualities of a lack of global action on climate change from a city planning perspective, at least some of them. We would have liked to have supported a motion uh, like this because, like you, Councillor Shree, uh, we share concerns about things like the polar ice caps melting, which uh, are melting at an alarming rate. We share concerns about rising sea levels, which are starting to inundate coastal communities in parts of Asia uh, and Oceania. And like you, we share concerns around the effects that climate change is having uh, on our endangered species. I read just uh, this week about the case of the uh, lemuroid possum, uh, which is on Mount Bartle Freer, just outside Cairns. Um, the ringtails there have evolved to thrive in cooler climates in the upper reaches of the mountain, and they can't handle temperatures in excess of 29 uh, to 30 degrees. And so the species continues to drift ever higher up the mountain, and they are disappearing from an elevation of around 800 metres now. They can only be found in elevations above 1,000 metres. Soon uh, they will be at the peak of the mountain and then there will be nowhere for them to go. We share your concerns uh, about the perennial news story. Every year a new record high temperature. London, Paris, Madrid, New York, Manila, Colombo, Hyderabad, Tokyo, all records this year will probably be breaking records next year and the year after that. We uh, have seen the disturbing and accelerating pattern in our climate. And we don't worry necessarily for ourselves, but we do worry about the impact of climate change uh, on our city and particularly on its most vulnerable citizens. We worry for uh, our children and those still to come. And we worry for the global south, who don't have the luxury of strong public finances, of infrastructure, and uh, who have the private sector capacity that we do here in Brisbane. We believe all this, and yet we can't join you in supporting this motion. Um, because to support this motion would be to support the climate extinction activists who have spent the past few months blocking our streets with canoes, gluing themselves to pedestrian crossings and disrupting the daily commutes of Brisbane residents. Now, Brisbane residents support the right of people to engage in lawful protests, but this form of civil disobedience is disruptive to the lives of the citizens that we represent. And most critically for you, Councillor Sri, it has failed to engender any additional support for your cause amongst those whose support you have sought. I listened to you do the rounds on breakfast radio this morning and to say that you had a frosty reception would be the understatement of the year. You've also managed to achieve three levels of government and the RSL condemning you in one career mail article. So, mate, that was an outstanding achievement. Uh, well done. You have likened their struggle to that of Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King and Gandhi. You have paid yourself an enormous uh, compliment. But understand uh, that what you and these extinction activists are doing is not seen to be even remotely like the civil rights movement or the struggle for Indian independence. It is seen to be extremist rhetoric from those who can most afford to spend unproductive mornings stopping those wanting to be productive with theirs. And can you really blame much of the population? They have been told lies about the Barrier Reef dying by 2007 or well, the Amazon rainforest disappearing by 2009. And let's not forget Al Gore's hockey stick graph. There is a level of distrust amongst the community for what you are saying. And these kind of stunts do not help to repair that. It is a shame because your underlying message is one of urgency, which we support, but it is lost in the disruption and the criminality that you promote. Brisbane residents don't support it and we can't condone it. 
And I've heard you say, Councillor Street, that this is a last resort because policymakers have failed to listen to your message. And I've also heard you say that... Councillor you... Murphy, can I remind you to address comment through the chair and to refer to Councillor Shree in third person, please? Yes, Mr Chairman. I've also heard Councillor Shree say uh, that he must do this because uh, big corporate interests have subverted the democratic process. Well, it was on radio this morning, Councillor Shree. And let's not forget, Councillor Shree was elected with 31 per cent of the primary vote, which was lower than anyone in this chamber, and the Greens hold one ward here out of 26. And the Greens also received the biggest corporate donation in history. So, you know, I don't need to point out the hypocrisy of this, but I believe it's self-evident. <laughs> to be clear, we agree with your aims. Many of them are noble, um, but we disagree with your method. Australia didn't achieve marriage equality by terrifying the population or disrupting their commute to work. They did a lot of their work quietly, behind the scenes, lobbying, writing letters, running in elections, creating slogans and logos, talking to their friends and families, and holding marches and parades that were organised and authorised by the police that many of us participated in. They didn't try to subvert the democratic process. They participated in it. And I ask you, Councillor Sri, through you, Mr Chairman, that if we supported this motion tonight, what would we say to Brisbane residents next Monday when Extinction Rebellion planned to block traffic all around Brisbane yet again, disrupting people on their way to work, stopping people trying to get to doctor's appointments and hospitals? They had this rally planned irrespective of the outcome of this motion tonight. How absurd is it to say that the old ways of representative democracy have failed us and that you need to undertake a campaign of civil disobedience and then bring this motion to a democratic chamber and ask us to support it. That is the definition of self-defeat. Even six months ago, with some changes in the language of this motion, we might have been able to support this, but in six months, you have alienated tens of thousands of Brisbane residents from your cause. And it's not like you didn't have an example of where this backfired recently. Look at the Adani convoys. The Greens movement caused ordinary people to run a million miles from their cause and handed all of central Queensland to the LNP, which we thank you for, by the way. Quite literally hoist on their own petard, Mr Chairman. I believe you, Councillor Street, that you should listen to that lesson, learn from it, understand that you cannot win this campaign by showing yourself to be out of step with community expectations. So no, we can't and we won't support these tactics. And I urge you to reconsider, to ask the Extinction Rebellion people to reconsider their approach, to work with Brisbane residents, not against them. Thank you. For the speakers, Councillor Burke. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Chairman. I just rise uh, to enter the debate on this motion about declaring climate emergency for the city of Brisbane. And I've listened to all the speakers this evening, Mr Chairman, and uh, I want to pick up where Councillor Murphy left off, because uh, for the best part of uh, what is now nearly 16 years, uh, this administration has gone about quietly uh, and diligently implementing what is the largest change of people's habits and behaviours and policy inside an organisation to acknowledge and deal with the impacts of climate change, Mr Chairman. We have deliberately worked to reduce the impacts without using alarmist language or extremist tactics uh, like those that we have seen, Mr Chairman, uh, but we have done it in the best interests of not only the residents of Brisbane, uh, but the greater state of Queensland, Australia and indeed the world. And unlike Councillor Murphy, for those who are watching at home, I am going to rattle off some of the things, uh, Mr Chairman, that this administration has done, because I think it's important to acknowledge what we have done, because we have been leaders in a lot of these uh, cases, Mr Chairman. And while some councils have been mentioned, Sydney, Melbourne, Darwin, Canberra, the state of ACT, I tell you what, Mr Chairman, this council has by and far outdone every single one of those when it comes to green initiatives, green commitments, and still does to this day because there is no larger organisation in this country that is 100 per cent carbon neutral certified than Brisbane City Council. 
There is not a state government department. There is not a cor private corporation. Uh, there is not a federal government department, Mr Chairman, that has taken the steps that this council administration has done to be certified 100 per cent carbon neutral. On top of everything else that we have done as an administration, we have amended our planning scheme to acknowledge coastal inundation. We have implemented a car share scheme amendment uh, to our planning scheme. We have updated our flood mapping to respond to the changing climate. We have purchased parkland across this city, at times to the opposition of Australian Labor Party councillors and independent councillors in this place. Mr. Chairman. We have implemented a building that breathes guide to make sure that buildings in this city respond to the climate. We are buying bushland like never before to protect it for future generations. We are planting tens of thousands of trees each, each year. And on top of that, this council implemented the largest reforestation project of its kind in this country, the Two Million Trees Project, Mr Chairman, and then that was adopted as a project by the federal government to roll out elsewhere in the country. We have implemented a flood resilient homes program, Mr Chairman. We have rolled out and expanded our community gardens program. We do gas flaring from our landfill sites, and we have a number of those across the city. We dragged Energex, kicking and screaming, to approve an LED light fitting so that we could roll out low power LED lights across this city to reduce energy consumption. We have invested in bikeways like never before. And much to the angst of the Australian Labor Party, Mr. Chairman, we rolled out a bike hire scheme in this city. They talked about doing it. We actually got on and delivered it for the residents of Brisbane. This council implements offset plantings for trees that we have to remove for projects. Does the state government offset trees that they remove for like the Gateway North upgrade project? No, they don't, Mr. Chairman. But we have one of the most rigorous offset planting projects uh, programs of any administration or of any level of government. We've doubled the number of buses on the streets. We've put more city cats onto the river than any other administration. We have, and if councillors listened in the budget information sessions, they would know, a rolling program of solar panels onto council facilities, Mr Chairman. We've instituted water saving technology across our sports clubs and sports fields, and we've rolled those programs out to residents in the past. We've implemented recycling and waste reduction measures right across the city, including green bins, co expanded compost programs, Mr Chairman. We've implemented energy saving measures for seniors, low income earners and businesses to help them save money and reduce their energy emissions, uh, energy usage. We do have already one of the largest educational and engagement campaigns of any organisation in this country, Mr Chairman, through our Green Heart Fairs, our Green Heart Schools program and our School Environmental Leadership Network program as well, Mr Chairman, where we actually go out and try to encourage people to make positive changes at home, at school, in business and in their communities. We provide discounts for electric and hybrid cars in our council car parks. We have our own hybrid and electric cars in council. We were the first place for car charges in public spaces when we put them into King George Square, Mr Chairman. And on top of that, this building that we are in was the pioneer for a green building rating for heritage buildings in this country. Mm -hmm. We have done as an administration more and continue to do more for, uh, to deal with climate change and to respond to a changing climate, Mr Chairman. And so that's why, without the alarmist terms, without the extreme actions that we have seen, we have implemented this change in our community and worked with residents and worked with community groups and will continue to do so, Mr Chairman. And that's why we can't support this motion. But I'll tell you what, talk is cheap because those opposite had their chance back in 2016. They had their chance, rather than doing, take a bit of what Councillor Griffith said, rather than coming now and going, we've got a climate emergency. Well, they had their chance back in 2016 in August when we brought to this council the um, carbon neutral policy for debate and to vote on. And what did we have from the Labor councillors? Well, they couldn't support it, Mr Chairman. The Greens councillor did not even talk about the item when it came through, Mr Chairman. He did not utter, so for whatever, he doesn't like to, he likes to say that we don't say climate change. For whatever reason, when he spoke on the item for uh, not very long, Mr Chairman, in the council debate on that day, uh, he did not even say the words climate change. Did not even say the words climate change. 
Uh, but then he and the Labor councillors in this place stood up and voted against council becoming a carbon neutral organisation and amending our existing policies to recognise that and to implement that change. We do get offsets from Australia through you, Mr Chairman, to those opposite who want to fulfil this furphy. We do get offsets from Australia. We do invest in Australian carbon offsets as part of our carbon neutral policy. But I guess the biggest bit of hypocritism in all of this, Mr Chairman, was when Councillor Shree said we shouldn't be doing airport expansions, we shouldn't be encouraging people to take holidays, when the Australian Greens are the beneficiaries of the largest donation in Australian political history from the founder of What If, which makes its money from car hire, plane trips, accommodation and holidays, Mr Chairman. This is nothing but a stunt because they had their chance, they didn't stand up and weren't counted at the time, and we've gone on with the job of delivering this and making sure the residents of Brisbane are well placed and responding to climate change across this whole city. And I can't support this motion because it does not acknowledge the fact that we are doing this work and doing it well with our community already. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it is interesting, uh, this new motion, and um, we believe that climate change um, and dealing with it is vital. And uh, we thought that the first amended mo or the first motion that was, um, we were trying to get up as an amended motion was the better way to go, um, because it was more realistic, less catastrophic, less uh, dramatic, and more about doing something that's practical for for the city and its people. Um, just for the record, we didn't support uh, the carbon policy for this city because so much of our offsets are purchased overseas in projects that we think are very dubious. Um, we think that that money would be better spent in Australia on projects that can be measured properly. Um, so even though we have concerns about this motion, we will be supporting this motion put forward by uh, Councillor Shri, um, because we believe that we should be joining other cities of the world in terms of acknowledging that there, are, there is a climate issue that needs to be dealt with now. So um, that's, uh, that's what we'll be doing today with the debate. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, uh, Councillor Shri. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and I thank the councillors for engaging in the debate. Um, I must say I'm, I'm disappointed but not surprised. The, I don't have time to unpack all the, what I would describe as um, weak arguments that the LNP have put forward um, in refusing to support this motion today, but I must say we heard a lot of talk and excuses and, and doublespeak. And, um, I, I do, I, I'll pick out one thing um, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Murphy, who presented what I consider to be quite a distorted view of the history of activism in this nation and, and seemed to present the argument that somehow the forms of civil disobedience that we are seeing at the moment are of a different class or category to the civil disobedience we've seen in recent decades, even here in Brisbane. And there would be many histories of uh, many historians from the um, LGBTI community who would take issue with your suggestion that um, disruptive civil disobedience and road protests and blockades and marches were not part of the history of that movement, um, when in fact that was a, a very crucial element of that movement in the early days. And I think that's really what, what frustrates me about this rhetoric that we're hearing is that um, the LNP have said, oh, we are concerned about climate change. Councillor Sri, we agree with everything you've said, but we can't support it because we don't like activists. That, that really seemed to be the thrust of what you were saying there. And, and I think really th that, w that was just a weak excuse because you, you don't want to support this motion because you recognise the implications of what that would do. If this council supported a climate emergency declaration motion, that would put pressure on the state government and on the federal governments to do more to shift away from um, their reliance on fossil fuels and to do more to stop approving new coal mines and new, new fossil fuel generating projects. So you understand, you don't want to say it, but you understand that that would be a significant step. But then you've presented this weak and, and self-contradictory excuse as a defence for not taking action. If you didn't like my motion, you could have moved your own. 
You could have moved amendments. You could have changed the wording. There's nothing stopping you from bringing your own motion that, uh, to a similar effect when, whenever you want. But, but you are not going to do that because you don't actually care as much about the issue as you should. I'm not saying you don't care. I'm, I'm, sure, you, I'm sure you think you're, you're on the right side of history. But your party's policy position on this issue is, is letting down the people of Queensland and is particularly letting down the workers who are going to be screwed over when we tell them that, oh, you can keep having your jobs in coal while, while other countries transi transition at a much faster rate. Um, so I, I, here's an offer to the LNP. I, I don't have the ability to order activists around, but I, I will ask and suggest that the Extinction Rebellion processes should stop blocking roads if your administration stops actively supporting new coal mines. That's a, that's a simple offer. I, I'm, I'm not negotiating on their behalf. I don't control them or, or order them around. But if, if you're genuinely open to conversation about what we can do to stop those disruptive road protests, let's talk about your party's policy on climate change and fossil fuels. Let's talk about the fact that the Liberal Party still supports massive government subsidies to encourage new coal mines, while frequently arguing against public subsidies for renewable energy projects. I could go on all day about this stuff, but I, 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 I guess, to be honest, I'm just feeling really, really sad for the, for the people of Brisbane that they are so poorly represented by an administration that claims to care about climate change, but when push comes to shove, what, won't stand up and make that public declaration. Um, I didn't bring this, in, this motion off my own bad. I, I honestly didn't expect the LNP would, to support, would support it to begin with. But residents came to me, par parents from the... Um, Climate Action Group came to me and said, oh, we'd like you to bring this motion, have a crack. And I said, sure. I don't have much faith in, in the LNP be, being willing to support it, but I said, okay, I'll bring it. Um, and I guess you've lived up to my low expectations today. Councillor Burke's um, justifications or excuses were perhaps even more perplexing than Councillor Murphy's. Councillor Burke said, suggest, seemed to suggest that the LNP couldn't support this motion because you're already doing so much great stuff. So we can't, we can't support declaring a climate emergency. Now, that, that too seems very self-contradictory and self-defeating because there's not, it, calling a climate de uh, emergency declaration doesn't ne reflect negatively on your administration. It, it doesn't devalue the good work that this council has already done. Um, but it would, it would be a strong and powerful um, statement to, to the people of Brisbane and to other levels of government. So, Really, the only two excuses we seem to have heard from the LNP for not supporting this motion are, we can't support it because we don't like the Greens, we don't like activism, and we can't support it because we're already doing lots of good stuff to address climate change. And that's the end of the conversation. Um, and I'd suggest through you, Mr Chair, that that's pre probably not the best strategic approach. And, and that the story will be that the Liberal, Liberal Party voted against the climate emergency declaration motion. Um, and, and other cities around Australia and around the world will continue to support those calls and dec declarations of climate emergency and will continue to put pressure on their higher levels of government to stop supporting new coal mines and to, to engage in a just transition. And so it, it, it does seem a shame to me that, that we're going to end up on the wrong side of history. But um, I guess I'd say to any, any Brisbane residents who are still watching the live stream or up in the public gallery to, to not lose hope. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's just, obviously it's essential that we, we take meaningful action to address this issue. And I think there, there will be a turning point and a moment where even the LNP is forced to acknowledge that supporting new coal mines is bad policy. That might not happen until they start losing a few more seats and a few more elections. And I'm sure the, the coming council election in March next year will be a telling one. Um, it's interesting to note that Councillor Peter Maddock didn't even want to stick around for this motion. Um, Point of, point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Marks. I'm happy to withdraw if there's a reason. Yeah, there that's is fine. a reason. Yeah, yeah. Can, yeah. Councillor Shree, there is a genuine reason. I'm, I'm not aware of the reason, so I'm happy to completely withdraw that thank, comment. Thank, thank you. All right. It's, it's, it's OK. <laughs> I've withdrawn. It's, it's cool. There's a... There's, there's okay, a all right. He, he's withdrawn. Yeah, it's, it's OK. Um, but, but my core point remains, which is that I think there will be a lot of Brisbane residents in, in LNP wards who are really disappointed by the decision that this council administration has made today. I think the, the Lord Mayor's comments earlier that um, the wording of the motion was alarmist, a completely out of step, not only with public expectations, but with reality. 
the, the, the wording of that original motion is, is not alarmist or extreme. It's stating the facts. It's pointing quite clearly to the fact that Brisbane is likely to experience more severe weather events, is likely to experience flooding and, and, and increasing insecurity of our food supply chains as a result of climate change. And so to describe such messaging as alarmist, I think does a disservice to healthy intellectual debate and discussion and, and does a disservice to the people of Brisbane. So we can, we can bandy around words here all night and, and I, I guess that's really part not, not the point of this at the end of the day. My, my point here in bringing this motion was pr to, to force the LNP to recognise the, the true ramifications of climate change. Uh, and it seems that they are unwilling to do so at this point in time. I leave it open the door. I hope that maybe in a few months the, the LNP will change their mind and will declare a climate emergency. Maybe you'll bring your own motion and maybe it's, it's just that the Greens are moving it and that's the reason you didn't want to do it. Um, I, I live in hope. but. Um, I, I guess at least I'll, I will thank the Labor Party for supporting the motion. Um, I, again, I, <laughs> I think the, um, some of the rhetoric was a bit, a bit shallow, but I, I won't look, to look a gift horse in the mouth. I, I appreciate the support. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm just really, I'm, I'm feeling sad. And, and I, hope, um, I hope the people who've been watching this don't, don't feel too dispirited or um, because there's, there's still a long way to go in this struggle, and, and I think we will win it eventually. Um, <clears throat> I now put that resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Council Division. Three and Councillor Strunk. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being six in favour and 18 against. The noes have it, please return to your chairs. <laughs> Councillors, I realise you're returning to your chairs, but we've moved to the of the evening where we ask for petitions. So if there are any petitions, please stand in your place and uh, to present them. Yeah. Councillor Howard. Uh, yes, I have a petition which I'm presenting on your behalf, uh, Chair, um, which is proposing changes to the Brisbane City Plan over property at 58 Inogra Road, Newmarket. Councillor Hammond. I have great delight in presenting this um, petition um, from residents requesting more street trees in Brisbane. Councillor Cook. 
Thank you. I have two petitions, one to immediately reinstate the bus stop at Milsom Street at Bottomley Park and another to stop a development at 10 Bede Street, Balmoral. So we're coming. Chair, petition in relation to the uh, Council's conduct of the appeal by the developer of the subdivision for Bilarong Street, Morningside. Is there anyone I can't, I've missed? May I have a, a, petition, a, a resolution regarding petitions, please? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concerned for Consideration and Report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Marks, seconded by Councillor Cassidy, that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concerned for Consideration and Report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, general business. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of a Councillor Conduct Review Panel order? No. Are there any matters of general business? Councillors, I, I identify that Councillor Atwood will now be presenting her maiden speech or her first speech and please that they allow her the courtesy of this presentation to be made in silence. Thank you. Councillor Atwood, welcome. Thank you, Mr Chair. To say that I am honoured to be the newest councillor for Doughboy Ward is an understatement. To represent the people of the place I call home is truly humbling, and I will always strive to make them proud. In the foyer of the Lord Mayor's office hang portraits of some of this country's greatest leaders, including Graham Quirk, Sally Ann Atkinson and Clem Jones. We have come as a city because of their great leadership since it amalgamated in 1925, and it makes me excited about how much more we can achieve for the good people of Brisbane, and in particular, my ward of Doughboy. Our newest Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, has hit the ground running, fighting for the Brisbane Metro and a cleaner, greener Brisbane. And his latest budget echoes this sentiment by announcing five new green bridges, the transformation of Victoria Park Golf Course into a world-class public park, better, sorry, better support for local businesses and halving rates for first home buyers. And that's just to name a few. The Lord Mayor is all about building the Brisbane of tomorrow while protecting the best of what we have today. He doesn't just say that. In four short months, he's backed up his talk with actions and outcomes. That's what this administration is all about. As the third councillor for Doughboy Ward, I would like to thank my predecessors, John Campbell and Councillor Ryan Murphy. During the past six weeks, time and time again, the community has sung praises for these two men, and I hope to do them proud by continuing their legacy of protecting Doughboy's sprawling green spaces, supporting our local community organisation, schools, and fighting for better infrastructure. But my primary focus um, as Doughboy's newest councillor will be fighting for mobility. If we want locals to use public transport, we need to ensure it is a better or practical alternative to driving. If we want locals to use our parks, we need to ensure there is enough parking or convenient public transport options. If we want people to walk or ride a bike to work, we need to ensure we have connecting pathways to get them from point A to B safely. Over the next eight months, I will work my tail off fighting for upgrades to the Eastern Busway. Locals in Carina, Belmont and Wakeley have waited far too long for a decent upgrade to their public transport network. It's been 10 years since it was first promised and we are still scratching our heads as to why it has been, delay sorry, has been delayed time and time again. Now, Myrie lies on the banks of the Brisbane River. It is home to one of the most prominent business parks in Brisbane. You'll find a treasure trove of international businesses due to its proximity to the Port of Brisbane, Airport and Gateway Motorway. However, public transport from the city to Myrie is a bit of a puzzle. Extending the CityCat network to Murray will not only service local residents and businesses, but add to our goal of seeing and doing more by encouraging Brisbane residents to travel out to Murray Recreation Hub or visit Br Brisbane's newest boutique brewery, Brewdog. Residents, I hear you and I'll fight for you. Doughboy has some of the best sporting and community parks across Brisbane, but there's always room for improvement, such as extending the Meadowlands Road car park a new off-leash dog park for Joe Bradfield Park, a new playground for Kuanawa Park, transforming the old Moreton Bay Sports Club into a state-of-the-art clubhouse for the Wynnum Wolves and the Wynnum Manly Cricket Club, a multi-use sporting facility for Hemant, and building the city's first public golf course on the south side in over 70 years. 
And last but not least, I'll continue the fight to upgrade the multitude of level crossings in Doughboy, in particular, Lindham Crossing. With Iona College only a stone's throw away, we need to ensure that we do everything in our power to make our roads and transport networks safer. Because the last thing any parent needs is to worry about a knock on the door from a police officer for an issue that has been talked about for far too long. However, Mr Chair, it is not the issues that define a ward, but the people in it, including my small family of four, Todd, Lucy and Georgia, who are up in the gallery tonight. Thank you. I was blessed to grow up in a tight-knit family of 10 in Stanthorpe. My mother was a stay-at-home mum for 25 years and raised eight children. But when my younger sister was nine, she took a chance and started her own small business, the Ugg Boot Lady, just south of Stanthorpe. But she didn't stop there. She didn't let her very limited experience in the workforce stop her from representing her community as a councillor for the Southern Downs Regional Council. My father is also an inspiring influence in my life. He taught me the importance of rolling up your sleeves and getting stuck into your job, to always strive to be your best and to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. My family instilled in me the importance of being present in your community, and for that I am grateful, especially in a time when social isolation is becoming more prevalent. One of my fondest memories growing up in Stanthorpe was playing for the International Soccer Club. On Saturday afternoons, Stanthorpe would almost come to a standstill as everyone flocked to the CF White Oval, the International Club or Ballandine Oval to play soccer in winter or cricket in summer. The clubs became gathering places for families and friends to socialise, enjoy a drink and forget about their worries. I understand the importance of building good infrastructure and supporting our local sporting clubs so they can, in turn, support their members and our community. The spirit of community is fostered when we support our clubs with time, resources and love. I also look forward to connecting with the many businesses in my ward. Growing up in a household with both parents running their own small businesses and today owning my own, I know the reality, the struggles, the hurdles of running a small business. The sentiment that small businesses are the engine room of Australia can sometimes be overlooked by a catchphrase. But it's been proven in this chamber tonight that it is 100% true. I was extremely pleased earlier this year when our Lord Mayor announced that Council will actively seek out local businesses to contract for Council's procure procurement spend and slash fees for local cafes and restaurants. Because if we don't get behind our local businesses, who will? My vision, vision for the future of Doughboy could not be complete without the support of a tremendous LMP team under the leadership of Lord Mayor Schrinner. I'd also like to to take this opportunity to thank some of my federal colleagues, Angie Loming and Luke Howarth. Their guidance and examples of outstanding leadership in their communities will be a lesson I will draw from throughout my career. While there are so many examples of strong women in this chamber, it is my mother's story that reminds me that opportunities are there for those who are willing to give it a go. As a young mother of two, a small business owner, and now a newly elected councillor, it is my hope that I can lead and inspire the people of Doughboy. As I embark on this next chapter of my life, I'm reminded of a quote by Abraham Lincoln. The best way to predict the future is to create it. With that in mind, I'll work hard to earn Doughboy's trust and strive to create a future for my community full of optimism and opportunity, creativity and community, and above all, a place where we put people first. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Councillor Atwood, and welcome. Are there further matters of general business? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr <laughs> Chairman. Um, as the time is, is drawing on and um, it is getting quite late, I will make mine brief. Um, I rise to speak in general business tonight, Mr Chairman, in regards to concerns the National Servicemen's Association of Queensland has raised with me today in regards to certain comments that have been attributed to a councillor. There has been significant coverage on the TV media um, over the evening news tonight and in the Courier Mail today about references of aligning um, activist protests to Anzac Day. Um, my national servicemen um, who have put their lives on the line for this country have expressed great concern of this 
um, reference and drawing a parallel between activist protests and Anzac Day. They are extremely distressed and certainly have conveyed to me that they feel insulted by this. And certainly as councillors in this place, it is our responsibility that when people put their lives on the line for our freedom and democracy, or others who have sacrificed their lives and not come home for our freedom and democracy that we have the liberty to enjoy and share in our country today, that we show the ultimate respect to them for it and ensure that there is no misrepresentation of what their service to our nation and our people and our freedom and our democracy really means. Our veterans deserve our respect and should always be held in the utmost regard. So as patron of the National Servicemen's Association of Queensland, I place my respect and my value in their service on the public record tonight and on their behalf to all veterans, I convey a very sincere thank you for their service. Further items of general business? There being none, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you, everybody.